You're listening to Artistic Finance, show 136. On today's show, I chat with Bill Rios and Phil Powers about liability insurance for lighting designers and live event production. We discuss types of insurance available, annual pricing and coverage limits, how union contracts affect insurance coverage, and the results of the Artistic Finance Insurance Survey for Lighting Designers. It turns out there are a lot of types of insurance I hadn't even realized. Some are very common. Your eyes are going to glaze over for a second here, but here are the types of insurance. Auto liability, workers' comp, general liability, key person insurance, inland marine slash property insurance, excess liability, also known as umbrella insurance, professional insurance, also known as errors and omissions, and AD&D, Accidental Death and Dismemberment. I say that Phil's production company is Luna Lux. It's pronounced Luna Loose, but Phil didn't correct me until the end. Phil joined us today after I heard him on the Light Talk podcast, where he mentioned the joys of insurance coverage. If you're a longtime listener, you may know that I'm trying to overtake Light Talk in the number of Apple podcast reviews. I'm currently trailing by two. So if you enjoyed today's episode, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review. Also, in the show notes is a link to the survey results. That is important because I have the list of insurance providers that we gleaned from the survey. So if we talk too quickly or you don't know how to spell one of those, head to the show notes to find that list. Without further ado, let's get to the show. You're listening to Artistic Finance Podcast, where your host, Ethan Steimel, interviews successful artists, leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire artists to grow their wealth. Welcome, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Ethan Steimel, and today I'm welcoming quite a few people here. Well, just two. (laughs) Uh, Two people who are from the live event production arena, Bill Rios, a lighting designer from Austin, Texas, and Philip Powers, lighting scenic systems designer and programmer at Luna Lux, LLC. Uh, Phil and Bill, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right, so we're recording this February 20th, 2023, and let's start off by getting to know you two. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? And I'll start with Bill. Sure. Uh, My name is Bill Rios, like Ethan said. Uh, I recently, after a a career in the technical entertainment field as a production electrician and technical director at the Tennessee Performing Arts Center, was my last like real job. Uh, Didn't particularly enjoy the management side that uh, my career had taken me. So I uh, hit the reset button with my wife, uh, went to grad school at UT Austin and got my MFA in lighting design there. Half of that was during the pandemic, so that was interesting. And so I walked in May of 2021, then just started working. And I worked pretty consistently up until the Omicron happened, and then everything kind of paused for a little while. In 2022, I I started up a LLC, just BR Lighting LLC, just to kind of help create that separation. I also joined USA 829 uh, that year. And so I'm just doing lighting design when I can. You know, my passion is there, but I also do freelance drafting in Vectorworks uh, for a couple companies, one of them in New York, Production Glue. And then I've worked for a company in Austin called Tangibly. And then I'm starting to pick up work in the architectural world with uh, James Sale Lighting. And yeah, that's kind of my world. It's, uh, you know, like like everybody, a bunch of bunch of plates up in the air and see, making sure none of them crash. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Uh, Phil, what about you? So I've been doing corporate event lighting design since uh, early 2011. I started my company in 2012 out in Los Angeles, doing everything from product launches to auto shows. I come from a background of theater, opera, dance, and concert. So a lot of that on the side or through the company, we also do a lot of museum design work and the uh, sort of more heavily corporate legal world of the (laughs) entertainment industry. And what's funny is I also ended up going back to grad school, Southern Methodist up in Dallas around the same time, the opportunity arose. So went back, finished my degree in the middle of the pandemic, then went to work in Vietnam for several months. That had to be interesting. 
So I was out there with Quantum Creative Studios. They needed a uh, fountains programmer. <laughs> so programming time code fountains for nighttime spectacular at Vin Wonders. All right. I've been to Vegas. I've seen the, um, not the Venetian. I don't know. There's some famous Bellagio. Bellagio. <laughs> I've seen the Bellagio fountains. Uh, we went to Dubai. They have a version of Bellagio fountains there too. Like how many fountains that are needing programming exist in the world? Like, like, do you? Do you do all of them? Like, there can't be that many fountain programmers. Well, as it's programmed on MA, there's a surprising amount more than you'd think. But there's, you know, there's fountain shows all over the place. not as noticeable as some of the large ones like Bellagio or even the Once show. But if you look at things like Fantasmic or World of Color, that's both fountain shows out in California for Disney that take programming. It's more similar to what I did. Those are both shows that I'm not associated with, but just good examples. The other thing is uh, LaGuardia's airport now has a fountain show. That's true. And now that I'm thinking about it, like there's a mall that I was in in Montreal that has one. And then there was one in D.C. I remember I was at a place that had a fountain show. So now that I think about it, there's probably several. (laughs) Yeah, just good old MA time coding. All right. So next question for you here. What is a live event that you like to experience as an audience member? And this time, Phil, I'm going to start with you. Well, I sort of uh, grew up and started my career in the uh, metal industry. So I will take a good metal show in either like the LA or Dallas club scene, sort of my go-to, something I enjoy. I just saw Judas Priest at the factory in Dallas. That was phenomenal. Uh, but I also have a love for opera. So uh, I will take a good ring cycle, any part of it, any day of the week. That is awesome. All right, Bill, how about you? Uh, I think right now my favorite thing to do are uh, immersive type of exhibits. So Meow Wolf is a real favorite and finding that kind of just newer museum exhibit that is also sort of an event. And then also um, a really good straight play. Just I do so many musicals most of the time that I just kind of want to sit down and not be sang at and and sung at and just uh, kind of enjoy a show. I love it. I just did a version of Othello. On principle, I hate Shakespeare just because I know I'm going to be sitting in the theater for five hours. And I'm like, ah, five hours of my life. That's an exaggeration. It's more like three. But I sat and watched this Othello that I lit, but I actually really enjoyed it. And I was like, yeah, I do so many musicals. It's so nice to just sit here, look at the actor talking and like focus in. I I have to say, I actually enjoyed Shakespeare. You you got me laughing because you're saying Othello is long and I just uh, sung Wagner's praises. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Fair, 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 fair. All right. So final, final uh, icebreaker question here. Um, Are you good or bad with money? And Bill, I'm going to start with you. Oh, I used to be real bad at money. And now I would say I'm mediocre at money. Responsible enough to find people who know what they're doing to help me not be terrible at it. So I've got a CPA who used to be a lighting designer and has kind of like taken me in as a client, which has been really nice. And then I've got a financial planner uh, that is helping me and my wife invest our money we used to be homeowners when we lived in Nashville, uh, and then we sold when we came to grad school. And now we're thinking about being homeowners again, except we live in Austin. So that's a crazy conversation. Do you really want to invest in in that kind of infrastructure where they can't keep the power on all the time? So, but we're actually, we're, we're okay at money now. Uh, it took a while to get there, for sure. I hear you. Phil, now for you, are you good or bad with money? I'm like two people. Personally, I'm terrible. From a business standpoint, I'm great. I could tell you full budget breakdowns, estimations, and cost quantities and lay out our expenditures for a year. Uh, personally, I'm like, oh, that's a shiny thing. And I lose my cash buying the shiny thing. So I'm two halves there. Uh, I will say, though, if you're looking to buy up in McKinney, we haven't lost power this year. So it's, it's a little <laughs> bit better off than Austin is. Okay, this is amazing. I accidentally got two people from Texas on one show. I will say, though, it's like a four hour difference between us. Yeah. In in other parts of the world, it would be, you know, separate countries broken. <laughs> I think we're the size of Europe, maybe. About half of it. Yeah. Amazing. So now we know who you are. So let's talk about liability insurance. And this all started because... Bill Rios right here, uh, reached out to me and he asked if we had discussed liability insurance on the show. We haven't covered the topic, so I decided that I need to cover it. So here we're doing that. I'm a lighting designer based in New York City. I don't have an LLC um, and I've never had liability insurance. I've been freelancing for 10 years. And the only time that I've ever wanted insurance was 
a year ago, I broke a hazer that I have because it's so many shows that I worked on. I wanted a hazer and it was always like, oh, we don't want to add it to the budget, whatever. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to get a hazer. But then it broke and I realized I didn't have insurance on it. I actually don't know that liability insurance would have covered it. There's this new thing I'm learning about called Inland Marine Insurance. Um, I think that's what I was going to need. But anyway, maybe I'm going to find that out today. Short version of this is that I'm now applying at colleges for a teaching job. So I'm going to move into academia. So I think my motivation for getting insurance, general liability, is probably even less than it was before because I'm thinking, oh, I'll be at a university. So what situations am I going to need this now? But Bill, I'm going to call you early career, even though that's not really not the case at all. But I feel like your insurance journey is earlier than Phil's. So I'm thinking Phil might be fielding quite a bit of these questions. So I'm going to let you, Bill, take over and sort of ask questions because I feel like your motivation is better than mine. You know, this started because I asked you. So the reason I asked you was I was working on a contract with a theater. We got into a conversation and they're like, wait a minute, you don't have liability insurance. And I was like, do I need liability insurance? And they're like, according to our contract. And I was like, oh man, let me go think about that. And I, cause I'd worked with them before. So I've already signed a couple of contracts and I was like, oh shoot, did I miss that? I actually reached out to the BA uh, in USA 829 central region, Matt Walters. And we talked it through. And so because I'm doing lighting design on a USA 829 contract, the cover page actually talks about liability insurance when you're doing a show and the producer is actually responsible for covering you. And so that kind of took care of that conversation. But it did start getting me thinking in terms of all the work I'm doing not under USA 829, like freelance drafting for big companies. And I was like, oh, man, I should probably do something to cover myself there. So I ended up actually getting professional insurance uh, to cover my drafting work. And I still haven't gotten general liability because this year, everything physical I've done would have been under a USA 829 contract. So I'm covered by the cover sheet. Um, But now I'm starting to do more work in an architectural field. So I will probably be investing in general liability to cover me outside of those USA 829 contracts. The insurance you got to cover drafting, what did you call that? What's that? It's called professional insurance. uh, And I'll find the... I ended up filling out the form. Oh, as in as in you filled out our survey and it's the answer is in there? Yeah, let me find. I can actually talk a little bit to professional insurance in terms of what that typically entails in the subcategories because professional liability is typically to protect you in terms of your professional standards. Uh, the most common is errors and omissions, especially if you're doing things like control design and drafting. Errors and omissions is the Oh, hey, look, you drew the system. We bought all the parts to build the system, but you didn't put a 12 volt power supply on this page that lost us a day of time. So it covers you in case, you know, on a job site, you're losing a day of time, which I'm currently working on a museum in Sacramento right now. If a day of time here would cost about three grand in labor. So that's there to sort of cover if one of your professional document mistakes leads to a loss of revenue or a claim. Yeah, errors and omission is probably the most common name people know about it. But uh, when I was fi- when I was getting it from the insurance company, they referred to it as professional insurance. Same difference. So, so here I'm thinking liability. You just need general liability to cover everything. Now I'm hearing well, maybe general liability sometimes, but oh, I don't know. I'm, how much insurance do I need? <laughs> well, let me, I could talk through sort of what we hold from the corporate end because we hold a little bit of everything. Okay, so this is Luna Lux LLC from the corporate perspective. Yeah. Because we have a uh, general liability that covers things like your standard physical damaging. So if someone is injured, if there is a product or a wall finish that's marred, if anything like that sort of happens where there's cost-related damages, that's typically general liability. Now, there's things that are typically excluded from general liability, like you know some general liability excludes historic landmarks or up to a certain value. So that's typically where we get uh, either umbrella liability or excess liability in there, which is another additional tier of liability protections. We have uh, automotive liability that's for both company vehicles and for non-owned rented vehicles. That is your general automotive insurance, but it's something that is required separately for the company because it's not like a one driver insurance policy like you see in a lot of states or a per vehicle insurance policy, like you see in a lot of states. And and when you when sorry, the auto, because I don't have a car. 
So one policy covers what you own and also rentals that you make throughout the year. It's two different lines on the policy, but yes, for us, it's one policy. One is our uh, company vehicles, which is a box truck and some vans. And the other is like, the, we need to rent an extra truck or we need a trailer. It's still covered under that scope of things. And, and you could rent uh, just like a car for, you know, people are in town, they need to get around, they're renting a car, or you could rent out like three tractor trailers to move stuff around. Is that all covered in that same policy? It's all covered up to a certain extent. So there's sort of a like threshold of this is the amount we're covering you for for this year. The last one's workers comp. We employ a lot of people. Workers comp just make sure if anything happens, you know, it's an, it's a not at fault system. It makes sure that there's no sort of arguments needed. Your employees are protected. Your uh, one caveat is a lot of places, 1099 employees are not covered under a company's workers comp. So to actually have workers comp apply to your employees, they have to be W two employees. Uh, but that's also good in general for people's taxes and their protections. Uh, but for all of these policies at the end of the year, uh, workers' comp is the most common. You get audited every year because that one's based off your payroll. But for things like rental vehicles and other things, if you have claims on the policies, that policy will get audited to say, how many vehicles did you rent this year? Was it falling under the contract conditions of what that insurance is? And that's sort of the how they end up gauging what your fees will be for the next year. But in total, right now we're holding, uh, let's see. We have a million dollar general liability policy for each occurrence, damage to rented premises up to 100,000, medical up to 5,000 per person, personal and advanced injuries up to a million, general aggregate on top of that is another 2 million, and uh, component damage and other stuff we have a million, and that's all under our commercial general liability, uh, sort of some adders we have in there in terms of increasing values. We sit at an automotive policy of a million. And then our umbrella liability is up to three million, and our uh, our E and O insurance, our errors and emissions, is another three million. So we're holding typically what matches our clients uh, for most of our contracts. And typically, when you get audited for insurance, they want to see any subcontractors you've hired match your insurance. So we end up having to match our clients' insurances pretty regularly. Well, that's that's way more than what I have. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Phil, I hate to do this to you, but I was trying to take notes and uh, you were talking too fast. I got that you had a million you had a million dollars of general liability. Damages you had up to a hundred thousand. Yeah, so that damages per occurrence. Like if we do more than a hundred thousand dollars in damages in one instance, they aren't gonna cover it. This is sort of a breakdown of that million. So is medical five hundred thousand person personal per person so every yeah so the medical is like if our general liability needs to cover someone being injured they'll cover five grand of someone being injured per person oh five grand not 500 grand oh if only <laughs> i thought that was excessive <laughs> well hey with our medical costs here it wouldn't be that yeah, i mean five grand would cover somebody's deductible on their health insurance um plus a little bit that's also why we have workers comp right right okay so i guess it's up to the insurance agencies and situation on like what is it going to be covered under the general liability or is it going to go under workers' comp? And it's almost always workers' comp first. Have you had to deal with that? Luckily, no. But the main distinction is workers' comp is for our employees. General liability is for not our employees. You drop Somebody drops something from a scissor lift and it hits another, somebody else. Exactly. And then you said aggregate of $2 million. Was that tied in there? So that's just sort of the general. There's a Outside of things that are broken down to find, there's an aggregate value of $2 million of coverage. Okay. And I, just because I talked with specialty insurance before this on a, another interview, when they said aggregate, to me, it sounded like they were saying the total policy is $2 million. All your claims can't go higher than $2 million. At $2 million, they'll stop paying. Exactly. But that, that is a separate policy than our $1 million. That's sort of on top. That's additional umbrella sort of overages for us. So our base policy is a million total for all uh, claims, and then the umbrella covers everything beyond that. Okay, so when you said the aggregate, that's a separate policy? That's an umbrella that's on top of it? Yeah, that's our umbrella aggregate, yep. Got it, okay, his umbrella. Okay, and then uh, you said a million dollar policy for auto? Correct, and that's just sort of your normal auto insurance. Um, okay, and then I got lost, so e and I think was next? Yeah, so we're uh, E&O, errors and emissions, we're holding three mil. This week alone, we've put out at least 100 pages worth of drafting from other people in the company. There's a lot there that's kept track of. Okay. And then workers' comp, is that a separate insurance policy? That is a separate insurance policy. And that is, you know, someone gets injured on site. You have an aircraft cable snap and cut through someone's hand. You have a pipe slide and crush someone's fingers. 
sadly, these are all things that are I'm speaking from real world experience having seen happen. So pleasant way to bring it down to earth here. <laughs> okay, so so that's like five different insurance policies that you have. And they're all compiled on a COI, a certificate of insurance that we send to clients and to venues. Yeah, that's another thing I learned today is that these certificates are required often from people. So you just have to write to all these insurance companies and say, we're putting your name onto these as well or something. So here's the fun part is getting insurance. Typically, you end up having to go through insurance an insurance broker, and they'll go to all the different insurance policies and underwriters to get your insurance, and they'll compile the COI for you. It's the fun game of every time saying, you need to have this person listed as additionally insured. So you have to go back to your broker and say, hey, I need another COI with this person listed. <laughs> I guess putting all this together, it's it's a lot. For, for me not having insurance, I'm like, oh, geez, this is a lot to think of. Um, but did you sort of start getting these things like as you got a vehicle, you're like, well, I guess I need auto. Like, how, how did how did you like first get all of this? I really wish it was like that, but it was more <laughs> so we started doing theater consulting about, hey, well, let's upgrade your lighting system. Pretty simple, easy to get forward theater consulting. So I started in the same place, just errors and omissions because everyone else was a contractor. We weren't doing the installs, none of that. It was just consulting. When we started doing large labor calls or larger projects for corporate clients, uh, we got the, hey, we need you guys to match our COI limits. So I went from you know one small $1 million policy to this sheet of uh, expenditures I have overnight. The fun part was getting people to actually underwrite our industry for insurance. I'll say this, at least on the West Coast, there used to be one guy who would do entertainment insurance for lighting. Luckily, I convinced a different insurance broker to give it a shot. Sadly, they're no longer with their company. So it's a, I've had a shift since then. But when people hear what we do and then they're like, well, I'm not sure we can get you covered. This seems like a concerning amounts of liability. <laughs> a little bit of writing up an explanation of what we do, what each person's position is responsible for. Like, hey, they're not going to lift over 75 pounds without two people. It was a, about a two-month process of me getting someone to insure us the first time. And that being said, I've gotten smarter and wiser after 12 years of this. Adjacent industries are our friends. Themed entertainment. Theme parks have been getting stuff insured forever. Going to theme park insurance brokers are way more likely to be like, oh yeah, your guys' risks nothing. You're not running a roller coaster that can get people flying. <laughs> so finding industries that have similar criteria to design work and integration work helps a lot. Yeah, because the the episode I did earlier today was specialty insurance, which is all for uh, circus acts. They mentioned lighting and I said, well, he hold on, excuse me. Uh, can you explain more about this lighting? And basically they, they do it, we'll call this an adjacent industry, but they do it through their DJ insurance, but they do cover like live event production and stuff. DJ insurance is a good alternative. These limits that you have, are these like required by venues and places you're working at? Or did you decide like a eh, million dollar auto sounds right? And, you know, a million dollar general liability, that sounds right. Did you do these limits or were these sort of like dictated? It was very much set by our clients. It was what they required. Some of them we negotiated down. So the first year I did this, I had a much lower auto policy for them what they were requiring because I, we had a single box truck we were renting. So I'm like, hey, look, there's no way we're going over this amount. If your insurance is okay with us having a lower amount here than you and you get their sign off, it would be okay if we have a, say, half million dollar policy there. So we're able to start negotiate with the clients so it's not completely matching. But for the most part, it's you're matching what your client's requiring. That being said, there's also contracts like we do a lot of museum design where we have to match the COIs. And we're like, hey, do I need to send you an automotive COI if we are doing this all remotely or never driving to site? Okay. And then in 12 years, you have lots of insurance. How many times have you had to make claims on them? And, and has it been complicated or has it been super easy? It's gone back and forth depending on who the underwriter is in terms of the difficulty. Like our current workers comps is through uh, Berkshire Hathaway. That's easy. No problems there. It files, it goes through, it claims are easy. We've had one general liability claim in the last 10 years. I'm knocking on wood now. And then we've had about three workers comp claims. We were running a crew of about 200 people for two years straight doing the Twilight Concert Series. I was very happy only having three workers comp claims by the end of that, to say the least. Yeah, congratulations. That's Yeah, a historic peer that was a little of a tripping hazard. Only three. I was very happy. And also, I'm just wondering what the cost of all this is. Like, how much, how much does this all cost? And I realize that your company is probably bigger than, say, if Bill Rios were to put on an event, you know, or light an event, what affects the cost of it? Or is it pretty much cut and dry of like, 
wherever you get the insurance is going to cost a certain amount? Or, or are there things that you do that sort of minimize the cost like that? Like, do you shop around, I guess? So we often will get counter bids for insurance. Our, our broker typically does shopping around between underwriters. Uh, we've recently been looking for a new brokerage. So we've been shopping around between brokerages. Uh, I want to say our general policies this year is costing us about 10000 Uh, But that being said, there's two ways. Either it's all up front or we finance the 10000 as monthly payments. And that's been reasonable. That's been a back and forth that fluctuates depending on how many employees we had that year. So workers comp is one that really fluctuates up and down versus claims on the other policies. At most of our policies, we hit 10 years with no claims. The prices went down significantly and we're much easier. We're getting more underwriters bidding on doing our insurance next year. Well, it's nice that it feels like it still works the same way as like your auto insurance policy. If you haven't gotten in an accident, they'll reduce it for you. Yeah. Or your broker will say, hey, look, they've been great. They've had no real issues. Their risk is low and shop it out to other underwriters. It's like auto insurance, but uh, you can make them bid against each other a little bit more. Um, Workers comp, you mentioned that if you're a 1099 employee, you don't need to cover them on workers comp. So do you only cover, like, do you only have um, W-2 employees? We only have W-2 employees. Uh, So in the state of California, at least, workers comp will not cover a 1099 contractor. But to actually be a 1099 contractor, now I'm going to talk this off the top of my head. We can look up the actual ABC legal definition. You have to control your own work hours. You got to control the safety of your site and you cannot really have your like, you must clock in, clock out stuff with a 1099 contractor for them to be truly defined as a 1099 contractor. So everyone we've hired even on 200 person labor calls is w 2 That means, hey, they're under workers comp. It also means, hey, look, we're covering a portion of their taxes. It makes it a little bit easier because a 1099 contractor also isn't going to be covered under your liability insurance. And actually, if you hire them as a 1099 contractor, your insurance wants you to have them match your insurance. So at the end of the year, for example, like we hired uh, Circular Rhythms one year, an audio company I love working with out in LA. And at the end of the year, we get our liability insurance like, hey, we see that you paid this company as a 1099. Can we have a copy of their COI? So I need to go reach out like, hey, Austin, can I get your COI? I need to send this off to my insurance. And he's done that to me many times also. But that way, if you have an individual as a 1099 and you're running actual liability insurance, you run into some issues. Yeah, I'm mostly a 1099 employee. Even the USA 829 contracts come out as 1099 contracts. And then, you know, the benefit is that they pay into healthcare and pension into the union. But all of that, you know, like, as so you asked if I was good at money and like, Phil, I'm good at the business side of the money because I like spreadsheets. <laughs> and so it's just like 20% go, gets cut off and goes into an account. And I never look at it until I need to pay my quarterly taxes. And so I pull from that, pay quarterly, because I am paying both sides of the tax as a 1099 employee. So it's a game that you can play. You know, I used to be a W-2 employee, and that's why I went back to grad school, was to have more freedom over the jobs that I picked. And I will say the nice thing is, since you're working as an LLC, uh, you can 1099 yourself as an LLC, and then pay yourself as a W-2 employee through your LLC, so you take your taxes out that way. Yeah, that's the S-Corp uh, solution, isn't it? Uh, you can set up an LLC to do the same. S-Corp is the more standard, but like you can set yourself on payroll as a W-2 if it's an LLC. You just don't take ownership split instead. Right. I think that's something that I'm going to probably set up in this next year or so because the the tax liability is pretty intense when you start looking at it, when you, you're trying to make it. And so you're hustling all the time. And then like at the end of the year, you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> I still, I've been paying quarterly and I still owe a bunch of money. Yeah, it's always uh, painful around uh, April, say the least. Great, which is coming up. Bill, were you saying you want to set up so that you can pay from your LLC, you can pay you on a W-2? Yeah, I want to do some kind of solution like that just because it, it does make the tax more efficient. I don't necessarily think you pay less tax, but your company takes part of the part of it and in terms of the personal aspect of it, like right now, my wife who has a W-2 static job, we take more out of her paycheck towards taxes because we po- we file jointly and that helps offset my tax responsibility at the end of the year. Yeah, because we've talked 1099 versus W-2 a lot on this show. Basically, it's like really everybody should be W-2 most of the time. Correct. 
And so I actually, one of the questions I asked was one of our guests, which was, you know, how can you help me? I'm just a contractor and I hire out and I pay on 1099 because that's easiest for me. But I want to do it like what's best for everyone and what's best for them, et cetera. And like, so how do I pay on a W-2? And it was basically like you just hire a W-2 payroll company and you go through it that way. So it's actually like really easy. I think having not done it yet. <laughs> we use Intuit. It's pretty easy. Uh, we just log in, we run payroll. It automatically deducts the taxes from our bank account, files the taxes for us. Now we hire people in six different states. So we're registered to pay taxes in six different states and figuring all that out is a little bit more of a headache. But overall, it's it's pretty, once you set up and pay for the monthly Intuit, depending on the number of people, you're paying pretty easy. I was like, well, I only pay like one to two people a year. And I was like, so it's it's still not worth it for me. So I still just pay the 1099. I at least know that if I ever get my act together and become big time, you know, sort of take a page out of Philip Powers book and, and go that way, then I feel like I'm not afraid to go that route. Interrupting the show to mention our Patreon page. Today's patron outtakes are a discussion about teaching theater design. I'm currently applying for university lighting design jobs. Bill asked me how that academic search is going. We ended up talking about MFAs, real-world experience, and where in the nation there are design programs. If you'd like to hear that frank discussion, join up as a patron via a monthly or annual membership. You can do that at patreon.com slash artistic finance. In addition to outtakes, patrons have access to early releases of episodes. Currently, our early releases are an episode on producing an Actors' Equity Showcase Code, and an interview with Hamilton costume designer Paul Taswell. I would like to give a shout out to two patrons who generously upped their pledges this week, set designer Josh Warner, who has just reached his two-year anniversary of being a patron, and Gary Archer, who is down in Houston. Again, I did not plan all the Texas connections. It just sort of happened out that way. Gary and I had the pleasure of meeting at LDI last year, and this is actually his second time upgrading his pledge. Gary and Josh, thank you so much. If you would like to join as a patron and have access to early releases, a private podcast feed, and support the show, sign up at patreon.com slash artistic finance. And now, back to the show. With all these insurances that you've got, like what is the timeline if I realize, okay, I'm getting a job, it's going to require insurance. Is it pretty quick and easy to get insurance? Um, And what do I need to think about if I'm going? Like, do I just go to the first person I can find and say, hey, I need all these insurances. Can you help me get that? I wouldn't go with really the first. Uh, (laughs) It takes, I would say if it's your first time setting it up, it takes about a month. And that's just in terms of shopping around, finding someone who will actually insure you and getting them set up. But you know, if you know someone who can say recommend, like I used to recommend uh, Pegasus Financial out of LA a lot to do lighting insurance. You could get insurance set up typically in about if they will underwrite you and now that's been settled from getting them to get quotes from the uh, underwriters to you signing the contract is about four to five days. Mine went pretty fast because I had a realization and I had already done a number of work without the insurance that I probably should have been having. And so I reached out to somebody who works in a very similar manner in the same field. And he gave me, you know, his broker and we got it set up within two days. Yeah. If you have the broker already, it's easy. It's just finding the broker that takes a while. But I didn't do a lot of uh, comparison. I was like, great. My friend trusts this guy. Awesome. I'm going with it. I'll probably reinvestigate when it comes up again and I'll take longer uh, to kind of just see if I signed into the right thing or not. I will say, you know, recommendations off friends tends to be one of the best ways to be, because if they find it easy to work with, you're going to find it easy to work with. The lack of headache. So typically we end up having two months worth of me and one of my business partners doing our annual audits. I'd love not to have to do that for that to be easier. So if I find a broker that makes that process easier, I'd be happy, but it's sort of a balance. When, when you're saying audit, is that like from the IRS or is that from the insurance people? No, no, it's a, it's an insurance audit. So it's coming from uh, typically the underwriter for workers comp is the annual one. And what they're doing is they're going through your payroll, seeing how many people you paid at what amount, because that's what actually sets your annual rate for your workers comp. Because that's based off of your payroll and your payroll quantity. So, you know, if you're paying someone so much money and 
you're paying this many people, they're going to have you at a higher rate versus if you're paying someone minimum wage, which we don't. But if we're paying someone minimum wage and it's two people, then it's going to be much lower workers comp rate. Uh, I will say a lot of workers comp insurance actually requires you to have a minimum of 10 employees as the base rate. So it doesn't matter how many people you have, they're going to charge you for 10. But that's the big annual audit. The other ones are just in case you had claims, you end up having audits to see if there's stuff you could have done to avoid it in case they need to raise your rate or not, or if you've changed policies to avoid that incident in the future. Okay. So Phil has all the insurances. Bill, you have professional, aka errors and emissions. I've got one of them. <laughs> yeah, I've got errors and emission insurance. And But you plan to get general liability. That's sort of on your radar. Yeah. If I'm going to start doing more work outside of a theater and in construction sites and whatnot, and I'm still going to be BR Lighting LLC being hired by another LLC, then I'm going to want to have that extra insurance just in case something happens. Because, I mean, the whole point of uh, that I did the LLC was just to separate my finances from uh, my personal finances. Because I was just getting, I was doing more and more work. And I was like, man, what if, you know, I mess something up, that accidents happen, but, and we live in a litigious society. So if somebody wanted to come after my stuff, they could have. And so it was just putting up a firewall between that and a bit of learning how to do that as you go. Okay. So you have Arizona Mission, general liability would be your next step. Auto would be if for some reason you buy a car or start constantly renting cars. It's something like that. And then the umbrella, I guess, is if you need more general liability, then you would throw on an umbrella policy. And then the last one would be workers comp, which is if you start, you know, hiring. I don't know if they have to be full time, but at least hiring a lot of people. So I think if I hired more assistants and I couldn't get the companies that I'm working for to pay them, which is usually the way that I try to do it. Um, is try to get the, the theater companies or, or whoever to write them a contract versus writing a contract through my LLC to pay them. And Phil, for the workers' comp, are those people that are doing dangerous things or is it just for anybody that works for you? Uh, so we're a California-based company. Uh, I live in North Texas, but the company is based in California. It's required for any employees that workers' comp is provided, uh, at least in the state of California. I believe that might be national, but I'm not sure. But that being said, we do categorize each employee. The risk of each employee is weighed in terms of how much they add to the premium of workers' comp. All right. And then something else, just because I learned this today about inland marine coverage, that I wasn't mentioned by you, Phil. Do you have that? So we have equipment coverage, which is a whole nother thing. It's a totally different broker, actually. So that wasn't on the COI I was reading through. We run a lighting rental shop and audio rental shop. Uh, We're actually our warehouses in Denton, Texas. We ship coast to coast. So that's equipment coverage, typically under the same as Marine. It's This is equipment that is rented out. It needs to be insured in case damage happens to that equipment while it's rented or damage happens in the warehouse. That policy is very much based on the value of the equipment at any one time. And with the equipment uh, depreciating over the years, that coverage shifts constantly. But if you ever are doing like finance purchases for equipment, so if you're buying equipment on finance, most financiers require you to get equipment insurance on it while it's being financed. Like the fact when you buy a car, you have to have 100% automotive coverage on it while it's getting paid off. So that is just equipment separate from all these other insurances. Okay, that seems pretty straightforward. So like in Bill's case, Bill, if you bought some lights, would, would Bill then need Inland Marine? Bill would probably want equipment insurance or inland marine on it just in case like your hazer died because it's owned. That being said, I am surprised more lighting designers don't have general liability because when you go to a rental shop to rent stuff, we all ask for your general liability COI because typically we require a hundred thousand to a million depending on what you're renting. You know, a lot of theaters tend to carry that. So we get the theater COI that's actually renting the gear, but general liability is what we base your rentals on. Because usually when I'm designing, it's like the company pays the rental. But now I'm thinking of several instances where (laughs) it was like a $500 rental. So I covered it and then I eventually got reimbursed. And now I'm thinking maybe that shouldn't have done, maybe that wasn't a good idea. Like I should stay out of it completely just for insurance reasons. For insurance reasons. I know there's a lot of rental shops that will rent if you don't have general liability, but what they do is they put a hold on your credit card for the full amount of what the equipment cost is to repurchase in case it gets damaged. (laughs) Oh no. (laughs) I think Four Wall did that to me once. Four Wall's done that to me many times before I started my own shop. Because it was like $700 and I was like, uh, just for expediency, I'm going to cover this. And they were like, 
totally cool. But and then I was like, you know what? Never mind. Never mind. I'm gonna put you in contact with some other people. <laughs> yeah, I I try not to rent my own stuff. I usually try to make the theater do it. You know, I base it off of the budget and the contract, right? And so. The other thing that I'm, I'm actually getting pretty good at is going to manufacturers and saying like, hey, do you want to do you want to sponsor this show? You know, we're doing a green production. Do you want in, you know, there could be some moves in the future to buy more LEDs and this this particular entity be like demoing. Basically, I've had some success in that, which then it's all, still the theater COI that gets put on it because I'm drawing the plot. And so. Uh, In those terms, I guess my errors and omission insurance would be covered, you know, if I put them in the wrong place and it fell, but the theater would have to pay the manufacturer for that gear. I will say that's also a really good point on a lot of our draftings for theatrical stuff is the whole, uh, we are not engineers, do not hold this to engineering standards, blurb, that should be on everyone's paperwork, always. Build it into your title block. (laughs) every page i don't even want to talk about it because i'm like oh knock on wood I, I put it on and i've never had an issue but i'm like when the day comes that there's an issue like is that going to help me i don't know hey, it makes your it allows your insurance to argue better for you because your your you know insurance is gonna be like well the drawings obviously said he's not an engineer why were you building off of it? all right so question for me i'm a designer i've never had the insurance i'm moving into academia but i suspect that if that's successful that I'm still going to be designing outside of academia. So do I carry on like I always have been, or do I look into either errors and emissions, general liability? Should I consider getting some of that? Here's the thing. If you're working in theater, typically the theater has you insured. If you're working in academia, you're insured by the school. You really don't need it. I would say, you know, I do a lot of things like outdoor concerts. There is no venue that has insurance. Uh, The client is, say, Facebook or Instagram. Their COI is not covering my design work or my crew installing lights. So I need insurance for renting lights for that if I'm not using our own stock. That's typically where I need my general liability. Uh, For errors and omissions, uh, no one's trying to build a building or a control system or order parts off your stuff in academia, typically. And even if it is you working for the school, designing a lighting system for your new theater build, saying, well, great, we need this many nodes and all that. It's going to cover under the school's errors and omissions because you're an employee of theirs. It's only when you're self-employed or owning a company that really comes down to you needing to have that insurance. Yeah, and I'm Ethan. I'm not sure if you're a member of USA 29, but again, if you if you are and you're doing your contracts through USA 29, again, the cover sheet basically spells out that the theater is going to cover you for insurance wise. So as long as you know you're doing that, then no, you don't need any more insurance. I would say just keep on doing that. So you're probably fine. All right. So I am USA 829, but I shouldn't say this, but I don't always use the contract when I design. You got to You got to do what you got to do, man. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> um, depending on who I'm talking to, I either get attacked or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So I was really, I was thinking more of the non-829 work that I may or may not do. Yeah, I mean, the other part of it, so if you are doing non-829 work, then just read through the contract because like, again, I, I just missed it. You know, I was working for a theater, my friend's the artistic director, and I like got into the contract really fast, even before LLC, before USA 829. And then I did a couple shows with them. And then we started doing USA 829. And they asked me about the insurance thing. That's why we're all here right now. And I was just like, oh, no. <laughs> like I read through <laughs> all the way to that point and missed that. So it's like, just pre- you know, make sure that you check to see if that's in the contract. And if it is, then you just I'd talk to them and be like, hey, this isn't a thing I carry. I've never needed it. Like, let's make sure that we're okay. Or you can start carrying it for that particular company you're working for if you really wanted to, if you didn't want to lose the gig. And and Phil, this is, might be a silly question, but is there anything that exists that's like, I could be covered for 10 days if it's just like one show? <laughs> and I was like, maybe I should get some insurance just for that one show and not the whole year. Is that a thing that I can do. I, I've heard of people doing stuff like that. I really went not a set up. There's shops that offer like they'll and like, so Wood and Nickel out of Los Angeles used to sell insurance along with renting stuff to film students. So they used to do like rental based long term insurance. I'm not sure if that was actually insurance or them just saying, hey, you pay this extra amount. We'll cover if there's, there's damages or not. I don't know if I want any kind of insurance from somebody called Wood and Nickel. Same. Uh, <laughs> 
But, you know, there's also, in terms of getting insurance set up quick, if you just need general liability for like renting lights, uh, Next is a consumer level insurance phone app. During COVID, when we shut down to almost nothing, we need to cut down our insurance costs. We still held insurance for all of COVID. We just swapped over to general liability and Next because it was cheap and it kept us semi current. But that's, I think, Next for like a million dollars general liability is like 20 ish a month. You know, not an exact quote there, but relatively cheap. That, that's another thing I've learned is actually looking into this. It's like, well, yeah, if you need a lot of coverage, it's going to be more money. But actually, everything seems like pretty reasonable costs. So I don't know why I just assumed like, oh, insurance is an expensive cost I don't want to deal with. But actually, some of the answers from the survey, it's like, you know, a couple hundred bucks a year, maybe not the worst thing to be doing with my life. No, and it gives you peace of mind. I'll put it this way. If you're in a Houston Space Center's museum and you go up in a lift and nick something, just having the general liability fixes the $200 paint treatment that might need repair. It's just going to be something that's there to help give you peace of mind. Um, all right. Before we wrap up, and by wrap up, I mean I want to just read some of the responses from the survey. Is there anything about insurance, liability insurance that we haven't talked about that either one of you wanted to point out? I don't think so on my end. Yeah. No, I'm just really glad you brought Phil on because, uh, man, what a wealth of knowledge in this arena. So thanks for being here. <laughs> well, I've learned everything I know the hard way and the painful way. So I'm happy to help people avoid that. Because I, I will say I got to where I am now mostly through mistakes of, oh, well, uh, that was not what should have happened. Oh, I need better insurance. Oh, I need to tell my, oh, if you have workers comp and you are hiring more people one year for a project than you typically do, give the heads up to your insurance company so they can adjust the rates then and not hit you with a massive audit at the end of the year. That's important. Okay, so this survey. So I put out this survey when Bill said, hey, can you find out more about this? And I got 33 responses. Of that, seven were magicians and circus performers. So I, I won't count those. But of the remainder, most most were lighting designers, lighting related or electricians, freelancers. A lot of people had LLCs, but there are S corps. There was a nonprofit. So anyway, so most of these are LLCs, uh, like fifteen of the people responding, and then mostly designers. There is some audio. There's an audio person in here. There's a production design person, event production, and then production electrician. Roughly, it's event and lighting people but I'm just going to read these verbatim. Um, so the question was, do you have liability insurance? And if so, why? So somebody said they have professional to cover errors and omissions for remote drafting design work. Bill, was that you? I was the first one probably to fill it out because I was so excited you did it. <laughs> uh, yes, the policy is required by master service agreements for some of our clients. Yes, it's contractually required for some shows and vendors that I freelance for. And I also believe heavily in CYA, cover your ass full general liability for a range of event spaces and circumstances. Yes, I want my assets separated and protected from the LLC and my venue required it. Yes, to protect against damaging equipment or people. Yes, it's required by clients and contract. Yes, our clients absolutely demand COIs, certificates of insurance, for liability and errors and emissions. Yes, it helps protect my company in the case of a lawsuit. Also, some companies require this insurance in order to do business with them. Yes, I work in the corporate and event world, and some companies I work for require it. Liability insurance is required by several of my clients and to protect my family and home. Yes, started out because I sell a product that I wanted to protect myself from for misuse. Now I have expanded for consulting and requirements for companies I contract with required for our contracts and protecting ourselves from matters beyond our control, accidents, and ill intentions. And then there are several people like me who don't have it. Um, no, I didn't really know liability insurance was needed until I asked was asked to purchase some for a university lighting contract. I'm considering it long-term or maybe contract to contract in the future. Um, no, I do not. No one has ever required it until recently. Um, and then there was the producer who was the nonprofit response. Um, they said, yes, general liability for overall protection for my company and freelancers and AD&D as required under the equity showcase agreement. I also have directors and officers liability insurance to protect the members of my board. AD&D is accidental death and dismemberment. Yeah, that's actually joint with our workers comp. I will say the other thing is, uh, so the directors and officers liability we also have key person insurance. So if uh, any of our C-levels ever got killed or died on site or something, uh, there's insurance to cover whatever unfortunate change needs to happen to keep the company running. That That is very important in terms of a corporate structure insurance. 
So, so that meaning like one of the higher ups gets killed and you need to bring in a CEO right now and you have to pay them. It, it's sort of to cover any sort of unfortunate thing. Say I, I'm one of the key individuals in my company. If, you know, I was to pass tomorrow, there's coverage for the like knowledge only I know, and they have to pay people to catch up on, or, you know, I'm the only one who knew the key code to get into the vault, paying someone to get that. It just covers the what's lost with the loss of a key person. So key insurance, and that's separate from all the other ones we discussed. Yeah, that that's a company structure thing. If you're just by yourself, it really doesn't matter, uh, except it might help your family, whoever ends up inheriting your LLC, balance things in the end. Another question I asked about liability insurance was I said, how long have you had it? So five days, I'm assuming Bill Rios, that might've been you. That was me. (laughs) Five years, six years, 37 years, three years, on and off for 15 years, depending on the year and who I'm working with. One year, six years, over 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, two years. Since I started freelancing, 30 years, 10 plus years, five, four, three years. Since 2009, I renew it every year, 10 years and 30 years. So it seems like people who have it find it valuable and need it. (laughs) Okay, how much do you pay? Oh, this is something we didn't discuss, so maybe we can touch on this after. How much do you pay for insurance um, and how much or what type of coverage does that provide? So these, we we don't know sort of like where these are coming from. So this is covering the gamut, but I feel like people listening might know where they fit in all this. You know, you might know if you're a Bill Rios and you might know if you're a Philip Powers. So $380 a year for $250,000 of coverage, $4,000 per year for $2 million general liability specific to the industry, including overhead rigging, $1,500 ish per year for $1 to $2 million of coverage, $10,000 of business property for tools. International insurance is available for an additional charge. $1,500 for a $5 million public liability policy. Somebody else says it's ranged from 600 to 2800 for the year. 35,000 annually provides up to 2 million in liability and 3 million in E and O. 5,000 roughly, 1 million dollars liability, 1 million gear coverage slash office coverage. 1,000 a year provides a million to 2 million aggregate in coverage. 1,000 a year for 2 million liability, injury and gear protection. $64 a month for two 1 million dollar suits. Seventy-two fifty a month for a million dollars in coverage. I pay about two thousand a year for four million in coverage. Twelve hundred, including liability and volunteer accident. About a thousand a year for three policies that provide up to a million dollars coverage each. We pay between seven to ten thousand a year, depending on the amount of overhire staff per year. We have ten million coverage for professional liability, five million workers comp, five million errors and emissions. 10 million umbrella liability, 2 million per occurrence for miscellaneous coverage. And this is required in contract terms by the majority of our corporate event, themed entertainment, and architectural clients. This is somebody from the UK says 150 pounds a year, up to $10 million in coverage. Somebody else says, oh, same answer, 150 pounds per year for 10,000 in coverage. And then 250 pounds per year for up to 5 million in damages. I just want to say this list right here is why you should shop around because the person (laughs) paying 35 K a year for the same coverage. I for less coverage than I have is uh, a a little concerning. I feel bad for Philip. Do you, I mean, do you have like a rough percentage of like, if you are grossing this much in whatever you should have roughly this much and you should be paying a percentage of that in insurance, you know what I mean? Like, well, each broker uses their own formulas for each underwriter uses their own formulas for whatever they feel your liability is and your cost. So it really varies. Uh, I will say no matter who we've gone through, we've paid between like six to 10,000 a year for our coverage and our coverage hasn't fluctuated that much over the years. Uh, what really has fluctuated is the number of people we are currently employing at one time or another. If you're paying 10 grand a year, over 10 grand a year for only 2 million liability and 3 million EO, you know, uh, you, you probably want to be shopping around. I hope that some of the people that respond to this listen and either say, oh, well, there's reasons why it's expensive for me, or they say, oh, maybe I should actually look around. And I hope also that they reach out to me to explain why it's more. Philip, do you have much experience in international insurance? Like, I'm not sure how much stuff you're doing outside of the States. You talked a little bit about going international and how does that figure into your into your picture? 
it all sort of matters who you're underwritten by. Some underwriters only cover things in a state, some cover things nationally, and some cover things internationally. The only real thing I hold internationally is E&O, because typically I'm not responsible for physical safety outside the United States. Right. You're probably not hiring the crews out in the international world. I will say doing international work, make sure you get an international health insurance policy. So that's like a temporary thing. Like, hey, I'm out of the country for three months. I can't think of a company now, but there's companies out there that will say, great, here's three months of international health coverage for that region of the world. In case something happens, like I all of a sudden need a rabies shot while in Vietnam and then you boat me over to uh, some other country to give it to me. Yeah. And uh, like going off the specialty insurance for performers, it was sort of like we cover you in the United States, Canada, Puerto Rico, U.S. territories. Outside of that, it just doesn't apply. So I suspect with some of our work, if we were to do an event somewhere, we would either have to purchase a policy in that specific area versus just sending drawings or something. Um, Okay, so then I asked, where do you purchase insurance? And feel free to jump in here as I go through this list. So first off was uh, Hiscox. I don't know how you say this. It's H-I-S-C-O-X. Hiscox, I think. Hiscox. It's it's H-I-S-C-O-X. And so that wasn't, uh, that was me. Uh, That's what is all over my policy. Um, But the broker was another company and I can find that. But yeah, that's who it ended up with. Uh, in terms of who was writing or, you know, who my policy is through. Okay, okay. So you're not alone. So his Cox was an answer. Frost and Company, Nashville-based broker with a great understanding of the industry right now. Not necessarily our local provider, but event liability insurance provider. Next, insurance through their website for me. For the entity, I needed a broker. Crew Cover is the website slash broker. Cover Wallet is who we use now, and the carrier is his Cox. It just sounds weird saying his cocks. I'm sorry. I just can't. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I was there with you. I'm like, sorry, Bill. I didn't realize that was your entry. My first thought was like, did someone put this as like a, 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 joke. a bad joke? Like, is this Bart Simpson pulling <laughs> out the survey here? I'll, I'll send you my COI. It's all over it. The only reason it was okay for, for Bill was that there's an HTTPS slash www. So like, it looked legit. Um, but some of the others, it's like, what? <laughs> here, how do you pronounce? <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, more on this list. Um, Hartford is the major industry insurer, somebody says. Someone else says Anderson Benson. Oliverisk.com, A L I V E risk.com. Liberty Mutual. It's hard depending on what you're looking to cover. I did a lot of Googling, talked to a lot of people, had good luck with Hartford and also my credit union. www.mdpins.com, mdpins.com slash arts insurance program. I I could talk to this next one. This next one's actually me because I'm currently in the middle of getting new brokers bidding. I used to love our broker. Our broker is phenomenal. A lot of the people we would go with at our broker have left and getting responses has gone from being a next day thing to like I bug them for three weeks. Uh, But I will say in terms of the actual policies, ours are held by Berkshire Hathaway via B Burke, which you can do directly and national liability and fire. And those are both in terms of underwriters, they do also do direct brokerage in certain situations and are easy to work with. Okay, wait, can you say that was B. Burke and then fire is a separate thing? That is national liability and fire. Um, I think currently our automotive and our general uh, and our umbrellas through them. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then the producer wrote that insurance for nonprofits.com is where they got their insurance. Just pointing that out because they're not necessarily lighting and production specific. Okay, so here's the final question. I said, are there any special considerations or things to think about um, about insurance? So one insurance company, Thimble, I reached out to wouldn't accept my status as a lighting designer and referred that I look someplace else for my market. They only have liability for entertainers. If commercial auto is required, it is often cheaper to obtain a commercial policy or rider via one's existing auto policy provider. Be clear on exactly what you need. Steer clear of saying you're an electrician because it confuses some insurance brokers. Say you design or are crew for shows and build things. I went with Ryan's specialty because the broker I work with used to work in entertainment as crew and as a production manager. I second that. Never say you're an electrician. It means something very different because we have to turn in like hiring documents for all of our people for workers comp. We list stage technician electrical. 
and we list exactly like they are not handling anything above 120 volts. Any work at 120 volts is just plugging into a circuit. The only wiring is below 120 volts and DC. So like we list all that out to be very clear, like, hey, they're not tapping into a 408 panel. So somebody else said, uh, just know that some venues require a $5 million coverage, I guess COA, COI. Make sure it covers everything you do and what kit you use. We carry errors and emissions, which is for design professionals. We are insured for up to $3 million per claim. It's critical to make clear to clients what you should be liable for and what you shouldn't. For instance, as an LD, you should be seeking disclaimers for anything rigging or engineering related, and you shouldn't be doing those things. Get an ETCP certified rigger. Yes, it helps you sleep at night. Getting insurance helps you sleep at night. Yes, make sure you know how many states and countries this covers. Also check to see if there's a cost per COI creation. Oh, that's a, a question I wanted to ask. Do you have to pay when anytime you need a certificate and you need somebody added on to the policy? Does that cost you? If it does cost you, I think you should change your insurance. <laughs> <laughs> it all depends. Some policies say, hey, look, you get 10 a year. Uh, this year alone, I think I've had to send out COIs to at least 40 different companies and groups. It all depends how many COIs you need to produce. Uh, luckily, ours, for our general liability, most of our liabilities, adding an additional insured for COI doesn't cost anything. If you Once again, if you're using Next.com, if you just need general liability as a designer to rent equipment or you know because you want it, that's all free. You just do it from the app. It's super easy and nice. Oh, man, I, I do not want to pay per COI. Yeah, I mean, they sent me a copy of mine, and I guess I'm maybe I'm unclear. Like, do I need to have one specifically for like if somebody asks for it, do I have to have it specifically recreated for that company? It all depends. Some companies required them to be listed as an additional insured or a certificate holder, which are two different things. Certificate holder just means they hold your insurance, and at any time they can check on your insurance. So, like uh, our warehouse, the person who owns our warehouse. Uh, is a certificate holder. And they check in our insurance every time it expires to make sure we renewed it. Versus an additionally insured is like, if they do something on site with our stuff, it's still covered. All right, back to special considerations. The coverage you need increases greatly once you start owning and renting out gear. So I assume that's sort of talking about the Inland Marine policy that you would probably need if you do that. A close friend was the LD on a show where a performer fell off the stage and broke a leg in the blackout. There was a lawsuit. Try to shop around. There are really different prices that come back. Some years, I've also procured film production insurance. Okay, I guess that's another one to consider. It's always better to have the need. You never know what can go wrong with a project or client. And the only place that has ever asked me for it has the option to go on a W-2 for them instead of a 1099 so that you're covered under their insurance, but still something I need to get to cover myself just in case. I would love to talk to the person about the blackout falling off the stage because there are so many steps in terms of liability for that to happen in terms of was the edge not glow taped? Was this a change before a show? Was this something rehearsed? Was there no net? Like, oh, I know. I also want to ask because it's like that is a frightening thing to consider. But also, like, I want to know what the outcome was, because it's like if it got back to me, there's a lot of things that it's going through to get to that point. Yeah, the amount of people it has to go through before it hits CLD for that is immense unless you know the ld all of a sudden program added a blackout before opening and if someone did that they should not be working in this industry <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> three hours before opening adds a blackout tells no one Jeez. all right so that's everything i had let's see a couple more questions though before i let you guys go what is one piece of financial advice or just advice that you can give somebody who's looking to get a policy for the first time what i did ask ask your friends and if they have good things to say about you know, the people that are using, go with that. I would fully agree. Best first step is ask your friends. The second step is get a second pricing. See what, what a comparison is. And also, if it's a client required thing, which most of these responses were saying, hey, my client requires it. Uh, see if there's leniency. See if like, hey, you know, we're only working on this one project and we lower this from 5 million to 3 million. Every time I've ever had to do something like that and was able to justify why it could be lower or should be lower, they've been willing to budge and we've made it work. So you're not spending extra money on insurance you don't need. I think a lot of people look at these contracts or or whatever and feel, or at least young designers, technicians getting into the field, they're like, oh, this is cemented in, right? And don't realize that things are edible. You know, you can, you can change it, you can negotiate, right? That's all across the board, whether it's insurance or rates or, you know, fees and stuff. All right. So ask your, ask your colleagues for recommendations and 
if something comes back and seems unreasonable or is going to be difficult for you, just follow up and say, hey, is this really a thing and how can we figure it out? I will agree. Everything's negotiable. A red pen is important for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, all right. Buy red pen. Noted. Okay. Uh, where can people find out more about you? Where can they connect with you? And who do you want connecting with you? You know, I'm a talker. I'm always happy to have a discussion. Reach out anytime. Company's webpage is www.luna, L-U-N-A, loose, L-U-X, dot U-S. Luna loose. I've been saying it wrong this whole time. You know, we get everything. We get loose, lux. We get loosey. It doesn't phase me. <laughs> okay. Amazing. Bill, where can people connect with you? www.billrios.com. That's my main page. My email is on there too. And like Phil, I love talking. I love helping people out. Whoever has some questions or whoever wants to hire me. All right, Bill and Phil, again, didn't plan this Texas and Phil Bill situation. I could talk to you guys forever. Thank you so much for uh, joining me and like trying to figure out this liability. I actually feel like I have a really good handle on it now. Yeah, I have a better handle on it too. So thank you, Phil. I'm just hoping I didn't confuse people. <laughs> <laughs> I think me reading the list of 40 answers is what confused people. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can make it sound better in editing. I can't. I already know that. <laughs> that list just made me realize how long worded I am because I could pick out my answer as the longest one of each <laughs> section. No, but, but I appreciated that because also with the magicians and the circus people, some of them elaborated on answers and it was, it's so helpful giving the context and the understanding because somebody who just says, I pay $150 a year for insurance is like, that, that doesn't help me too much. You did technically answer the question. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, C, you got a C. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But okay. All right. Okay. So we're all done. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Thanks, Ethan. That's it for this week's episode. Now, after we recorded, I got a couple of new survey results. So here they are. I buy short-term general liability policies whenever I do large-scale festivals, since there are so many people walking around in the dark, and the work is often done on an 829 contract. Otherwise, for theater, no. And as an 829 designer, the producer is contractually obligated to carry comprehensive general liability insurance that covers my work. So carrying liability insurance would be a tacit admission that I needed it, which I shouldn't, according to the contract. The contract requires the producer's general liability insurance to cover the work of the designer. If I'm hired as a designer on 1099, I will never touch equipment or climb ladders for exactly these kinds of sticky liability reasons. If a producer wants me to do the work of the crew, hang lights, run a console, do anything on a ladder or lift... I will only work on W-2 as an employee where their insurance covers my labor. Someone else said, yes, it's required for me to have it for cruise ship projects I work on. When asked about special considerations, they said, inland marine equipment policy through the same provider is very much worthwhile to me, especially since I sometimes rent my gear. Deductible and premium are both much lower than my homeowner's insurance. Their recommendations on where to buy are... Athos Insurance, A-T-H-O-S, and State Farms Business In-Home Rider attached for a $2 million aggregate to the homeowner's insurance. My takeaways today are that, yes, I can get away without insurance as a theater designer, especially if I'm on a USA 829 contract. Insurance isn't cost prohibitive. Looking back on 10 years of freelancing, I likely could have had liability and equipment coverage for $50 a month, which over 10 years would be $6,000, which over 10 years would have been $6,000, and it could have helped me replace equipment and or let me have a little bit more peace of mind. Ask your friends for recommendations. This is the advice we get over and over again. Your colleagues are doing what you do, and they're always willing to share. If for some reason you don't have peers in the industry, you can of course reach out to Artistic Finance. Before this episode was released, I did share the survey results with someone who reached out on LinkedIn, and I connected them to an insurance provider. Artistic Finance certainly doesn't have all the answers, but we will bend over backwards to get you that information. And a note about the person I helped, they said they connected with USITT and LDI for information on insurance, but neither group could help. 
Saying this to say, I'm very proud that artistic finance is able to help where other industry players aren't able to. There are many other takeaways from today's episode, but I'll end with this big one. In the show notes is a link to the survey results. Yes, I read them during the episode, but the PDF has a concise list of the insurance companies that we mentioned. So if you didn't catch it, if you're unsure of the spelling, visit the show notes either in your podcast player, over on YouTube, or at artisticfinance.com. You can view the PDF and pull information if you need. I have no affiliation with any of the insurance companies, but they are companies that other designers and event workers use. Was this episode helpful to you? I know I found so much value in it. It's too late to fill out the survey, but if you have information you'd like me to share, send it over and I'll put it into the results. A reminder that I'm still trying to overtake Light Talk with the number of Apple Podcast reviews. If you're feeling generous today, please go leave an Apple Podcast rating and review. If you happen to love Light Talk and you don't want me overtaking them in podcast reviews, but you still want to support me and artistic finance, Please join us as a patron producer. You can sign up at patreon.com slash artistic finance. Lastly, don't forget to mark your calendars for our next Financial Independence Book Club. We'll be discussing Get Good With Money, 10 Simple Steps to Becoming Financially Whole by author Tiffany Alish. That discussion will be led by Emily Crimmins, and that meetup is Sunday, March 26th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, and 6 p.m. in the UK. Check out artisticfinance.com slash book club for the details and to start reading the book. That's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Make sure to subscribe. To access our show notes, transcripts, or resources, go to artisticfinance.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decision, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Artistic Finance. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.